Our scripture this morning is taken from Psalm chapter 54. Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. Strangers are attacking me. Ruthless men seek my life, men without regard for God. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Let evil recoil on those who slander me. In your faithfulness, destroy them. I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from all my troubles, and my eyes have looked in triumph on my foes. Let's join together in prayer. Our Father. 1952, <clears throat> that was in the last century, I was, I was 15 years old, and now you know how old I am. <clears throat> My parents sent me to our church's school, our denominational school, uh, just outside of Chattanooga. I've been telling you I was a really nice guy. They got me out of town. And uh, the school had a junior college, a Bible college, and had a high school all on the same campus. And some of the young men there studying for the ministry had been, were veterans of Korea. And one of those young men, <clears throat> my lemon juice, it's lemon juice, okay? One of those young men was a Korean veteran and he was a very devout Christian. At least I viewed him as a very devout Christian, far more devout than I was at 15 years old. And one night in, our, in one of our group meetings and we would sit around and talk, he began to acknowledge that he had a real time, tough time with his prayer life. He said, when I begin to pray, he said, my mind begins to wander into all kinds of things. And he said, I have a hard time sometimes concentrating on God and concentrating. He said, in fact, a couple of times when I was on my knees next to my bed late at night, he said, I actually fell asleep praying. And that really bothered him. It really, it really troubled him because that he would, his mind would wander and he would think about other things and, and he struggled to focus on God. Now, I know none of you have that problem. And yet, I dare say that if we were all to be really honest, really be truthful this morning, we would all say that at times we struggle with our prayer time. We know that prayer is one of God's greatest gifts to us, but sometimes we face the struggle and our mind wanders and we think about other things. And I don't know if any of you have ever fallen. If you were in bed asleep praying, you may have fallen asleep praying. But those sort of things sometimes cripple us when it comes to seeking time with God. Prayer is, I think, a universal part of world religions. In the Middle East, men will sit and, with their prayer beads and go through their prayer beads. In the Far East, the, Bus the Buddhists have prayer wheels in which they attach prayer requests and prayers and they spin the wheels and the idea of that somehow that, that works for them. In some cultures, chanting passes as prayer. But in biblical Christianity, from our point of view, I, I would like to, to make a de give you a definition of prayer. It's not probably the best definition. It may not be your definition. But it's my definition, and since I have the micro two microphones, it's, you're going to hear my definition of prayer this morning. I, I define prayer as a born-again believer communicating with God in person. A born-again believer communicating, speaking with God in person. And, those, and in that prayer, there are three elements. There's God, there's the believer, and there's the communication, the speaking. Without God, there's no one listening. Without the believer, there's nothing being said. And without the words, there's nothing being conveyed. And those, those three elements, I think, are very important. That if we have the three, the believer, God, and the, the words, the communication, it enables us to have a, full, <clears throat> a rich, a fruitful, and fulfilling prayer. And so I'd like to examine those three elements for a few moments, if my voice will, <clears throat> will let me. And 
let's do it in reverse order. Let's talk about God, first of all. The scripture tells us that God <clears throat> plays really important roles, numerous roles in our life. He, first of all, he is our creator. Secondly, the apostle Paul says he sustains us. It's in him that we live, move, and have our being. It is God who, if we come to him in faith and, and honesty and we ask for forgiveness, he will forgive us of our sin. And more and equally important, he will reconcile us to himself. In Luke chapter 11, the, fair, the, the uh, prodigal son came back after having wasted all of, his, all of his goods that his father had given him. He came back and his father saw him afar off and he fell on him <clears throat> and he kissed him. He reconciled the son. He said, my lost son is home. Kill the fatted calf. Put a clean robe on him. Give him some shoes. And God does that for, once in a, for us once in a while when we come to him. When we initially came to him, we were worse than the prodigal son. But God reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, through our believing that his son, Jesus Christ, paid the price. And I think it's fair, I think I'm safe in saying that that's the testimony, that is the, that, that's the experience of most of us in this room this morning. We have been reconciled to God. The psalmist in this Psalm 54 is believed to have been David. And it was during this period of time when he was fleeing from Saul or from the enemies. And he understood the fact that he needed to communicate with God. He understood that God would hear him. He said, hear my prayer, O God. <clears throat> Listen to my words, the words of my mouth. He understood quite well. He appealed to God. He assumed that God would hear him. He assumed that God would respond to him. That He assumed that God would do something on his behalf. The writer, if it is indeed David, used a number of strong words, a number of verbs. He said, save me, vindicate me, hear my prayer, listen, Lord, sustain me, destroy my enemies. Those are the expressions of his heart towards the sovereign God of the universe. His appeal was seeking a response. He was wanting God to intervene. He knew to whom he would go. He knew to whom to appeal. Think for a moment. <clears throat> We've all, especially if you've had children, we've all had the experience of trying to communicate with a small child. A small child hasn't developed a, a vocabulary, they're, they're rational, hasn't developed, and, and it's a difficult time to try to communicate. Or, or someone that you have absolutely nothing in common with and you try to talk to that individual. Well, with those things in mind, would you then marvel at the fact that the transcendent God of the universe stoops low and he listens to his frail, finite creature speak to him. And especially when you think in terms of some of the babble that we offer as prayers. It's sort of like, here, Lord, here's this one for this morning. But when we really get down to the serious nub of it all and begin to try to talk to God, we understand that he hears us and that he responds to us. We are his creation. He listens to us, and that in itself should shake us to the point of wanting to have a closer, a deeper, a broader relationship with him and understanding with him so that when we communicate, we can communicate with some degree of intelligence, with some degree of emotion, some degree of passion, some degree of honesty. And we come by that by studying God's word. When we study God's word, we get, begin to understand him. We begin to understand who he is and who we are and understand his reaching out to us. And that, to this day, is an amazement to me that God cares for us. The second element of this prayer definition that I gave you this morning is the born-again believer. <clears throat> the, the one who is in relationship to him through his son, Jesus Christ. Listen to the words that he says. This is, this is two or three verses together. Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your might. And the inference is, and when you do, I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. Those are words of a believer. Those are the words of someone who is coming to God with with absolute confidence that he hears and absolute confidence that he will respond. God is gracious in that he has given us this mechanism of communicating with him. 
this prayer. The scientists, the, the doctors, the, those psychologists and all of them, and I've never been one and never played one on TV, they say that, that, words, that words come out of our mind and out of our intellect. I would suggest to you this morning that prayer not only comes out of our minds where the words are formed, but they literally communicating with God also emerges from our heart, who we really are, deep down the center of who we are. If we're just reciting words, we're reciting words. But if we're really communicating, if we're really talking with God, if we're really from the depth of our soul talking to God, it makes a difference. The deep and the weighty personal matters of life require, I think, a, a heart response to God. And in order to have that, we need to have a deep relationship with God. We need to understand him and, and we need to change the superficial language that we often use and express that what is deep down in our heart. The groanings, if you will, from God to God so that he knows our heart. And the third process, if you will, or the third element is the communication itself. It's the words. It's the words. We need to continue to keep in mind to whom it is we are speaking when we pray. And we, we must be conscious of the fact that the message we are sending is important. It is really important. The words do matter. My friend Rush Limbaugh says words have meaning. Rush Limbaugh being my friend, come on. <laughs> words have meaning. They, they, they matter. They make a difference. Listen to what the psalmist said. Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your might. He's not lost for words. He knows exactly to whom he is speaking. He knows exactly what it is he needs, and he states it directly. But there are times in our lives... There are times in our lives when words fail us. I've had them, you've had them. There are times in our lives when we are unable to express the deep needs of our heart. Communication with God becomes a real struggle and, and, and what we need to do is be comforted with the realization that when those difficult, hard times come that God understands us, he knows us. And we need to also rest in the fact that it's during those times that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. Romans chapter 8 verse 26 says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, those difficult times. In the same way the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. We know not what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes on our behalf. The apostle has assured us that during those difficult times, those times when we are so weary, we are so emotional, we are so stressed and distressed that words just don't come out, that they just don't sound right and we don't know what to say, that it's in those times when the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, comes to our rescue and he appeals to God on our behalf. If any and all of that I've said this morning is true, then we still need to be very conscious. We need to be very deliberate with our words. And I believe that the words that we speak and the intent of our heart, the intent of our heart, either enhances or hinders our communication with God. The intent of our heart. Are we coming just because it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon and we've decided it's time to pray at 3 every, every, or do we come when we really want to be in touch with God? I would, you know, I, in the past, well, in fact, let me, let me, let me do something. Let me, let me, let me show you from the scripture some, some of the attitudes, some of the mindsets that, that people have when they pray. From Psalm 136.1, the, the, the writer gives some, gives some thanks. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 90, verse 7. He is in anguish. This writer is in anguish. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. Something's going on in his life. 
And he acknowledged, we are consumed. We, we, this is how we feel. Psalm 43, verse 4, he makes a promise. He's, he's appealing to God, deliver me from some evil men. Then will I go to the altar of God. To God my joy and delight. I will praise you with the harp. This is the, I will praise you with the harp, O oh God, my God. And then again, we have a writer who is really distraught. In Psalm 77, 7, will the Lord reject us forever? Will he never show his favor again? Those are words spoken when one recognizes the sin of Israel and, the, and of God's judgment to come. Will God reject us forever? The answer is no, of course, if you repent. So we see different kinds of expressions, different kinds of emotion, different kinds of appeals, different patterns to be used in communicating God with God. But if we want to closely stay in touch with God, we have to go to the book, know and understand who God is, know and understand who we are, stay in touch with him. And by the way, communicating with God is a two-way street. The song that I sang demonstrates a two-way street. Learn to listen to what God has to say to us. Pastor, does God, you know, speak? Oh, say, pay attention. No. God speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through songs. He speaks to us through the testimony and the words of a fellow believer. He speaks to us through a message on occasion. We need to be willing to listen to what God has to say. Listen to what God has to say. So on, a, on occasion, I have, uh, I have asked you a tough question. And I've never asked you to raise your hand when, in these tough questions. But I'd like for you to try an exercise this week. During your devotion time, during your prayer time, go to Psalm 54. And, and see if you can identify three ways that the writer, David, three ways in which he thinks of God. <coughs> Three ways in which he, he is aware of himself. And then finally, if you would, note the different ways in which this prayer in 54 is different from your prayers. And see if there's any way we need to change the way we approach God. Scripture tells us that we are to bring our petitions to him. That we can enter into his presence boldly, not arrogantly, not haughtily, not thinking that we are owed, we are due, but we are come boldly in, in confidence that we have a relationship with God through his beloved son, Jesus Christ, and knowing that he hears and that he answers our prayers. Father, we want very much to be in communication with you. We want also to hear from you. Help us hear from you in your word. Help us hear from you in a song. Speak to us, Lord, through the encouragement of, of a brother or sister in Christ. Speak to us through the message of a pastor or a teacher sometime. Help us stay in constant communication with you is my heart's cry this morning. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. I want you to join with me, Lord, in my life.